title is How Irrational is an Irrational Variety. And so I want to start by talking a little bit about what are rational and irrational varieties. So what is that? I'm going to try to, let me see if I can get rid of this video panel. Hide floating meeting controls there. Okay, whoops. Okay, so what is an rational and irrational algebraic variety? So this is something that's very important and fundamental in algebraic geometry, but it doesn't really, it's not, it's, it's, it's not something that has a direct analog, for example, in topology or differential geometry. So I want to spend a little time starting by explaining what rational and irrational varieties are. So I want to can, uh, start by considering X will be a smooth projective variety of dimension, complex dimension N over the complex number. So you can think of that as just um, a complex, compact complex manifold that happens to embed in projective space. And the projective embedding isn't that important, but it just means that there are a lot of sub varieties and a lot of meromorphic functions and so on. Okay, and then there's a notion of what it means for this uh, algebraic variety to be rational. So let me state the definition and then I'll explain it. So one says that X is rational if you can find Zariski open subsets U in X. So U will be a Zariski open subset of X. And another Zariski open subset of n dimensional projective space, V with the property that U is isomorphic to V as a non-compact, as open algebraic variety. So they're isomorphic as non-compact algebraic varieties. Okay, so what does that mean? So you start with this compact variety uh, X, and then you remove a algebraic subset Z. So you remove a, a closed set defined by, um, by some polynomial or analytic equations, and that's U. So a Zariski open subset means you start with X and you remove a sub variety. And then you do the similar thing in projective space. So you start with projective space and you remove a sub variety W. So X, uh, U is X the complement of Z, V is the complement of W. And then we're asking the U is isomorphic to V as, um, as non-compact, as open algebraic varieties. Um, another way to say the same thing if you like, is that you can think of, you can start with a variety U, which is the same as the variety V. And you can think of, to say that X is rational means that X and projective space are two different compactifications of the same open variety. So that's another way of saying the same thing. So it turns out that this is a very interesting, uh, this is a very interesting property of a variety to, to have a Zariski open subset that's isomorphic to a Zariski open subset of projective space. And as we'll see, it's very, it's most varieties don't have this property. There's another way to say the same thing, which is that we can ask that there be what's called a, a rational isomorphism of U with projective space. So that means this, or a rational pr parameterization of X. So what's equivalent is that we should be able to find N, that's the dimension, N different meromorphic functions on X with the property that if we use them to define them as coordinate functions, define a, a map from X to CN, which we can think of as being in PN. So we use these N meromorphic functions as coordinate functions. We should get a mapping that's generically one-to-one -one and onto. So that's generically bijective. Now there's something that has to be said here, which is of course, when you use meromorphic functions as the coordinate functions of a mapping, it's not everywhere defined because they might have poles or you might have zeros and poles intersecting. So a meromorphic function is a function that's not everywhere defined. So you usually draw it with a dotted arrow like this. And so what you can, uh, what we're saying is that you can find this sort of generically, but not everywhere defined function that maps X bijectively onto its image in projective space. And so another way of saying that is that X admits a kind of a parameterization by rational functions. And more generally, so this is what it, more generally, if you have two different algebraic varieties, X and Y, you can define a notion of birational isomorphism or birational equivalence, meaning that a Zariski open subset of one is isomorphic to a Zariski open subset of the other. And that defines what's called birational equivalence. And so yet another way of saying uh, what means for X to be rational is that it's birationally isomorphic to projective space. So it's in the simplest birational equivalence class. Okay, 
So let's look at some examples. So what about dimension one? So suppose that X is a one-dimensional smooth variety. So that's a compact Riemann surface. Well, then X is rational if and only it's, if it's isomorphic to the Riemann sphere, to projective one space. And uh, for smooth varieties of dimension one, the whole notion of birational, birational isomorphism is the same as just regular old biregular isomorphism. So birational geometry doesn't exist in dimension one. But as soon as you go to dimension two, you get a very interesting uh, picture that's been both classically and recently the, the subject of a huge amount of activity. And so I, one way to sort of understand the landscape of birational geometry is to, uh, to look at what happens for smooth hypersurfaces of dimension n and degree d. So let me tell you what's known and not known there. So let's let x uh, in projective space of dimension n plus one be a smooth hypersurface of degree d. So what does that mean? Well, you take a homogeneous polynomial of degree D and you look at its zero locus and that defines a hypersurface. And the degree of the hypersurface is the degree of the polynomial. And so the behavior of this hypersurface as we'll see depends very much on the degree. So let's see what happens degree by degree. So what happens if you start with a hypersurface of degree two? So that's some kind of quadric hypersurface. And then it's very classical that a quadric hypersurface is always rational. It's birationally isomorphic to projective space. And the birational isomorphism, I'm drawn in here, is given by stereographic projection. So what do you do? You pick a point on your quadric hypersurface. So here on the sphere, I've drawn the North Pole. And you pick a complementary pro uh, projective space of dimension n, and you project from this point onto this complementary projective space. So here, this purple point here, I take the line and I project from this, this is the center of projection, the North Pole, and then I map this point here to this point on PN. And evidently this is one-to-one, uh, -one, generically one-to-one -one and onto, but you can see that it's not everywhere defined because the, this North Pole here doesn't know exactly where to go. So this is your typical rational map, projection from a point. Okay, so degree two hypersurfaces over the complex numbers are always rational. And then you get to this very interesting range from degree three to degree n plus one, and that's the really interesting and subtle range. So it's unknown in general, and very much an interesting open question, which hypersurfaces in this degree range are rational or not rational? So this is a, a, a big open question. And just let me tell you what the story is for cubics, which is already very interesting. So degree three hypersurfaces. So it's very classical that a degree three surface in P3 is rational. So that's very classical. But when you take a degree three hypersurface in P4, so a, a three-dimensional cubic hypersurface, this was an, until the 1970, a famous open problem. So cubic th uh, threefolds are always unirational. So what that means is that you can find a rational map from P3 onto your hypersurface. And in dimension one and two, it's known that if you have a unirational variety, it's rational. And for many years, it was an open problem called Lurath's problem, whether or not the same thing is true in higher dimensions. And it was a big breakthrough around 1970 by Clemens and Griffiths and Askovsky and Artin and Manin that the cubic, well, the, the cubic threefold was done by Clemens and Griffiths. So they showed that it's not rational. And this was one of the first big applications of the Griffiths intermediate Jacobian. So that's a very beautiful story from around 1970. And once you go to dimension four, you get into famous op currently open problems. So a cubic fourfold is always irrational, uh, always unirational. And there are probably many families of cubic fourfolds that are known to be rational. And everybody expects that the ones that aren't known to be rational are, are irrational, but nobody knows how to do that. So that would be a big, that would be a big theorem. So there's this degree range in degree D from D from three to dimension plus one, where you get to these incredibly subtle questions. But now something interesting happens that once you get to larger degree, the whole question collapses and it becomes very, very elementary. So 
The claim is that if you take a hypersurface of degree at least n plus two and pn plus one, that's never rational. So for example, a cubic curve in the plane, a quartic surface in P3 and so on, it's elementary that those cannot be rational. And why not? Well, there's a, a simple obstruction to rationality, which is the presence of holomorphic forms. So here's how this goes. So you take your variety and we wanna look at this space H and zero vec. So this is the finite dimensional vector space of holomorphic N forms or uh, holomorphic differential forms of type D bar closed forms of type N zero. So these are differential forms that are locally of the form F of Z times DZ one wedge DZ two wedge DZ three and so on. So these are, this is a, these form a finite dimensional vector space. And uh, the remark is that if, if a variety is rational, then this vector space has to vanish. The rational variety can't carry any holomorphic N forms. And why is that? Well, one shows the point is that it's not hard to see that a holomorphic N form, the holomorphic N forms on a variety are birational invariant. So if you have two varieties that are birationally isomorphic, the spaces of holomorphic N forms are, are isomorphic. On the other hand, one can show that on projective space itself, it doesn't carry any N0 forms. The space of N0 forms on projective space is zero. So if you have a, a variety X that's rational, and so by rationally isomorphic to projective space, it can't carry any non-zero N forms. So, so a rational variety doesn't carry any holomorphic, only doesn't have any non-zero holomorphic N forms. On the other hand, if you have a hypersurface of degree in Pn plus one, you can compute the space of holomorph, the, the, the space of N0 forms. And it turns out that the space of N0 forms on a, on a projective variety of dimension, a hypersurface of dimension N and degree D, the set of N0 forms is isomorphic to the space of ho uh, homogeneous polynomials of degree D minus N minus two. So as soon as the degree D is at least N plus two, this space at HN zero is a uh, non-zero. And so uh, X can't be rational. So the whole question of rationality kind of disappears once these, th this is the most elementary obstruction to rationality. And once you have holomorphic N forms, there's, there's no more question of rationality. But I want to sort of, instead, I'm, I'm, as I say, there's been a great deal of interest in, in progress recently in these questions of which varieties are rational and what's the behavior of rationality in families. But the, the topic I want to talk about today is kind of a complementary to that. Namely, I want to, the question I want to talk about today is supposing you have a variety that's non-rational, that you know it's irrational. So for example, a hypersurface of degree at least n plus two. So the question, uh, the, the sort of body circle of ideas I want to talk about today starts with an irrational variety. And then the question is, can you measure and control, so to speak, how irrational it is? So can you say that one variety is somehow more irrational than another one? And how do you measure this? How do you compute it in examples and so on? So my question today is to the sort of topic today is we're going to start with an irrational variety and try to understand, so to speak, how irrational it is. Okay, so how can we measure how irrational an irrational variety is? Well, let's start with the simplest case in dimension one. So let's start with a, a compact Riemann surface. And then there's a very natural way to, to sort of measure how irrational it is. And this is called the ganality of C. So C will be a compact Riemann surface, a smooth projective curve. Now, and I want to define the ganality of C as follows. So any curve, any Riemann surface can be expressed as a branch covering of P1 of the Riemann sphere. And I want to look at the least degree of a branch covering. So given C, I want to look at the least degree with which you can express as a branch covering of P1. And that integer is called the ganality of C. Um, equivalently, any uh, Riemann surface is the Riemann surface of an algebraic function. So of a, a polynomial of the form f of zw equals zero. And then the ganality of C, you, you look at all the different uh, polynomials of which C is the Riemann surface, and you take the minimum degree in one of the variables. And that's, that's the ganality. <clears throat> 
Okay, so let's look at some, whoops, let's see, what do I have to do here? Let's look at some examples. Whoops, okay. So ganality one means that C can be expressed as a branch covering a P1 with degree one. So that's an isomorphism. So ganality, a Riemann surface, a curve has ganality one if and only if it's rational. What about ganality two? Well, ganality two, means that you have your curve can be expressed as a two to one covering of P1. And those are called hyperliptic curves. That means that C is the Riemann surface of an algebraic function of the form W squared equals H of Z. So H is a polynomial of, um, of some degree. And so these are hyperliptic curves. And these are kind of the most special curves, essentially in, in, in the theory of algebraic curves, hyperliptic curves are always the most special ones. So if you have a, and if you have any, if you have a curve and you know it's hyperliptic, that governs its geometry. You don't really care about the genus. So somehow hyperliptic curves are always the most special curves after P1 itself. And so those are the curves of ganality too. So the ganality is the least degree of a covering of P1, uh, ganality one is rational and ganality two is these hyperliptic curves and those are the most special ones. And I should say that um, we're gonna also wanna deal with singular curves and the ganality of a singular curve is defined to be by definition, the ganality of its, its non-singular model. Okay, so ganality two are the most special curves. What happens if you take a general curve? Okay, so one can show if supposing you have a general curve of genus G, then uh, one can compute its ganality is roughly G over two. So it's the integer part of G plus three over two. And what do I mean by a general curve? Well, as you may know, there's a big, something called the moduli space of curves of genus G. So curves of genus G are parameterized by um, a variety of dimension three G minus three. So there's three G minus three family 3G minus three dimensional family of isomorphism classes of curves of genus G. And in this, uh, so each point in this big variety, variety of dimension 3G minus three corresponds to an isomorphism class of curves. And there are some uh, closed union of closed sub varieties of that. So if you throw them away, what's left over consists of curves whose ganality is G plus three over two. So in general, the ganality of a curve of genus G is in between G2 and G integer part of G plus three over two. And uh, the general ones have the ganality G plus three over two. So that's the story for general curves. But now it's an interesting question to ask, can you compute the ganality of interesting classes of curves? So for example, there's a classical uh, observation of Max Nerther that says that if you start with a smooth plane curve of degree D, so its genus is roughly D squared over two, its ganality is D minus one. And again, you get a degree D minus one map to P1 by taking per stereographic projection from a point. So that's the ganality of a smooth plane curve. And you can also ask about the ganality of interesting curves that come up, for example, in as parameter spaces. So this is a much deeper fact, a result of originally by uh, Dan and Bramovich, that if you look at the modular curve, so that's the curve in, in uh, that parameterizes elliptic curves with a suitable uh, level structure, its ganality grows linearly in n. So the ganality is at least a constant times n. Okay, so the ganality, the, the, the sort of starting point for this is the ganality is kind of the right way to measure how irrational a curve is. So now the question is, what happens in higher dimensions? So how can we, if we're given a variety, a projective, let's say a smooth projective variety of dimension N, how can we, gen, how, can we how should we uh, talk about how irrational that variety is? So what are natural measures of irrationality? Okay, well, this, the, the most straightforward uh, generalization of, um, of the ganality of a curve is just to look at coverings of your, any variety can be expressed as a covering of Pn, and we could look at the minimal degree of that covering. So we'll define the degree of irrationality of X to be the least degree so that you can express your X rationally as a branch covering of Pn. So again, we want these definitions to be 
by rational invariance. So we want to do a, a covering that might not be defined everywhere. It's a rational map. It's defined by meromorphic functions. But we ask that there be a, a meromorphic map from X onto PN so that the general point has degree delta pre-images. And the least such delta is the irrational degree of irrationality of X. And so to say that the irrationality degree of irrationality is one means that X can be expressed as a rationally as a degree one covering of PN. So that means that X itself is rational. So the degree of irrationality is one if and only if X is rational. So this is the direct analog of the ganality of a curve. So the ganality of the curve was the least degree of a covering of P1. So here we have the least degree of a rational covering of PN. So this is the most uh, direct generalization of a ganality of a curve, but it's sometimes rather difficult to deal with. So there's a, another way you can, another direction in which you can generalize the ganality of, of curves, which is to reduce the, the, to look in higher dimensions of what curves cover X. So we'll, we'll define what's called the covering ganality of X as follows. So if you have a projective variety, any projective variety has tons of curves on it. So you can always find lots of families of curves that cover any variety. But we can ask ourselves, what's the least ganality of family of curves that covers X? So we'll define the covering ganality of X to the, be the least integer C. So there, there's a family so that through a general point of our variety, we can find a possibly singular curve of ganality C passing through X. And so that's called the covering ganality. And so again, if you're back in the case of curves, that's the same thing as the ganality. But in higher dimensions, what, what does covering ganality measure? So covering ganality is one, means that you arrive through, any, through a general point of your variety, you can find a rational curve. And that's a cousin, that's a notion that's kind of a cousin of X being rational. That's called X being uniruled. So if you can find a rational curve through every point of a variety, that means you can take a there's a new variety of the form Y cross P1 that maps onto your variety. So that means that it looks roughly like the product of a smaller dimensional variety in P1, and that's called unirule. So these are two, they're in higher dimensions, there are various different. Uh, there's rationality and various cousin notions. And so covering ganality is the, the measures the deviation from being uniruled. And in general, the, the covering ganality is less than or equal to the degree of irrationality. And you can see that because if you take, if you have a degree delta rational map from your variety to PN, and you take a line in the PN, you take a P1 in PN, then the inverse image of that line is a curve on X. And that curve comes with a degree delta map to P1. So the inverse images of lines in P PN are a family of curves on X exhibited with degree delta map maps to P1. So the covering ganality is always less than the degree of irrationality. But we'll see that in general, you can get in inequality. And similarly, um, this hasn't been does hasn't come up so much, but it's going to come up a little bit in the next hour. So let me define it now. You can define the covering genus of X. So that's the least genus, so that X is generically covered by a family of irreducible curves of geometric genus G. So these are natural ways to to measure how irrational varieties are in higher dimension. Let me just say a word about the history. The degree of irrationality actually first came up, um, I think it was first defined in commutative algebra by Heinze and Mo. And it was some examples were computed in the, I guess in the 80s by Yoshihara, but it it really came into, into kind of focus maybe 10 years ago in work by Bastian. So the circle of people around uh, Pietro Parola, in particular Bastianelli. So I'll explain their, their theorem in a minute. And um, so it's sort of it, it's sort of in the last ten years or so have sort of has come into focus as an interesting these kind of measures of irrationality as an interesting question. Okay, so these are the invariants. So good. Can we what can we say about them? Can we compute them in any cases? Oh, I'm sorry. Ash, here are some examples. Right. So this is what I want to do. Okay. So let's see some examples. Um, so let's start with a smooth surface of degree d. 
and let's see how what we can say about these invariants. So you, one of the nice things about this subject is you get some kind of fun geometry in low dimensions. So, okay, we take a, a, a two-dimensional hypersurface in P3 defined by an equation, a, a polynomial equation of degree D. And so I claim, first of all, that the covering banality of X is at most D minus two. And here's a picture, here's the geometric construction that shows you this. So you've got this surface in P3, and now pick any point on the surface. So here's a, a point. And now imagine drawing the tangent plane to the surface at that point. So the embedded tangent plane to the surface uh, in P3. So that's the, P to the plane in P3 that's tangent to the surface of X. Well, that plane is gonna meet the surface in a curve of degree D, but since it's tangent, a tangent plane, it's gonna meet the surface in a singular point. So if you take the embedded tangent plane and you intersect it with the surface, you'll get a singular curve, a curve of degree D in the plane, but it's singular at, at that point X. And now if you project from X, just like in Noether's theorem, that you define a degree D minus two map from that uh, curve to P1. So these singular plane curves of degree uh, D have ganality at most D minus two. So this shows that to any point in a surface of degree D, we can find a curve of a, 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 a singular curve of ganality at most D minus two. What about the degree of irrationality? Well, it's always less than or equal to D minus one because just as in Noether's theorem, you can project from a point on the surface. So if you take stereographic projection from a point on the surface, that gives you a rational map of degree D minus one from your surface to P2. But now something uh, interesting happens, namely uh, for Noether's theorem, all smooth curves in the plane of degree D had the same ganality, namely D minus one. But in, once you get to surfaces in P3, there's some special things that can happen. So let's imagine that our surface contains two skew lines. So imagine that we have the surface of degree D that contains two skew lines, L1 and L2. Then I claim that the degree of irrationality of this surface is at most D minus two. So then we can define a map of degree D minus two. And that goes like this. So look at the lines in P3 joining a point P1 on line one and a point P2 on line two. Now, if you look at all, if you take two skew lines and you look at all the lines joining a point on one to a point on the other, you get a family of lines. And if that family of lines covers P3 once in the sense that for a general point in P3, a general point X in P3, there's only one point P1 and one point P2, so that X lies on the line joining P1 and P, this line P1 and P2. So for a general point on the surface, uh, we take, there's gonna be one, one point on line one, another point on line two, so that that point on the surface lines on, lies on this secant line. So we can map the point X to the point on P1 on L1 and the point P2 on L2. And if you think about it, so, the L, so this gives us a rational map from X to L1 cross L2. And these uh, L1 cross L2 is birational to P2. So that's basically a map from X to P2. And these lines will meet X in D minus two other points besides P1 and P2. So this is a degree D minus two map. So now this is an interesting fact. For any degree D, I can find lots of surfaces that contain two disjoint lines. So this example, these examples exist in any degree, but the surfaces of degree are uh, at least four that contain two skew lines are special. So this doesn't, these examples don't exist for all surfaces. So here you can, you can define special maps for special surfaces. Okay, so now what's the, uh, what's the story in general? So what can we say in general? So the first, uh, so we've kind of defined these invariants, we've looked at some examples, and so now we like to sort of try to compute them and say something about them in some cases. And so the first theorem is uh, a theorem about hypersurfaces. So let me state the theorem and then I'll explain who it's, it's due to. So, okay, so we take a smooth hypersurface of degree D in Pn plus one. So again, that means it's defined by a homogeneous polynomial of degree D. 
And first of all, the covering ganality is at least D minus N. So if we go back to our example of a surface of degree two, uh, degree D in P3, we saw that in fact, the covering ganality is at most D minus two. So in fact, when N is two, we get exactly D minus two. So the covering ganality in this case is equal to D minus two. And then the next, um, quite the next part of the theorem involves the degree of irrationality. So let's assume that the degree, we want to assume that the degree is reasonably large, at least 2n plus 2, and x is very general. So I'll explain in a second what that is. And then the assertion is that the degree, the degree of irrationality is exactly d minus 1, and the maps you get of degree d minus 1 are by rational equivalent to just projection points. So this, this business of projection from points are... Um, is, exact, is the typical thing that happens. Now, what does it mean very general? So I just showed you a minute ago some examples where you could find uh, surfaces, uh, maps of lower degree. So you need, it, this isn't true for every hypersurface. And so what very general here means is, well, it kind of means that if you pick a, a hypersurface at random, this will be true. So one way of saying this, that precisely what it means is that the set of a hypersurface of, of, of in, in projective space is you write it out in terms of monomials and it's determined by the coefficients of the, very uh, the various monomials. So all hypersurfaces are defined or parameterized by some big projective space or big vector space whose coordinates are just the coefficients of the monomials. And what very general means here is there are some countably many subvarieties of the space of uh, coefficients so that you throw them away and what's left over um, is the ones for which this is true. So um, the, for a very general hypersurface of degree D, the irrationality is just D minus one, but again, there are these special ones potentially where something different happens. Okay, so what's the history here? So. Uh, the, 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 as I said, this, the, this story got started with a very nice paper of Bastianelli, Cortini, and Depoy. So they proved the first statement and they proved the second statement uh, in dimension two and three, and they conjectured it in all dimensions. And then with Bast Bastianelli, Depoy, Lawrence Ein, myself, and Brooke Ollery, we, um, we sort of proved the conjecture and did it in all dimensions. So I don't want to say too much about the ideal now. I'll say a little bit more in the next hour. But the idea, which I think really goes back to Parola and then with some very nice geometry of Bastianelli, Cortini, and Depor in this paper, the idea is to exploit in an interesting way the positivity of the space of N0 forms. So remember, these N0 forms are, you know, the, the presence of non-zero N0 forms is the first obstruction to rationality. And so the idea here is you want to somehow say that as the degree of the hypersurface grows, there somehow these forms become more positive. You somehow there's some positivity built into these things. But the positivity, interestingly enough, isn't just a question of the dimension of these groups, but some kind of the geometry of these forms. So the idea is you want to look at if you have a, these holomorphic forms, as you'll see in the next hour, you want to say you can find forms that vanish at some point, but not another point. So it's what's called how many points they separate. So I think I won't say more about this now, but I'll talk more about it in the seminar. But the idea is that um, this exploits some, some kind of slightly delicate positivity properties of these N0 forms. Okay, so that's the story for hypersurfaces. Now, um, but what about more precise co computations for these covering invariants? So uh, we saw that for a surface, the covering analogy is D minus two, in general, it's at least D minus N, but there's a nice uh, computation by, let's see, this is Bastianelli, Chiliberto, Flamino, and Sapino. They essentially computed, they used the ideas in the proof of the previous theorem to essentially compute what happens for a very general hypersurface, again, exploiting this positivity of forms. And what they showed is, I mean, the I have not given the precise statement, but essentially the covering ganality of a very general hypersurface of degree D is roughly D minus twice the square root of N. And again, the, the construction is you look for tangent planes that are high, that oscillate to very high order. So those will be planes that meet the hypersurface in a curve that's very, very singular. And that um, 
it cuts down the ganality of the curve. And in particular, for a sort of a weak statement, if you fix n and let d go to infinity, and don't worry too much about the sort of exact precise statement, the covering ganality grows roughly like d. So the covering, I mean, ignoring these kind of lower order, these terms just involving the dimension, hypersurfaces of degree d for large d are covered asymptotically by curves whose ganality is close to d. And again, you can ask for what happens for the uh, genus, the covering genus, and then um, with Olivier Martin, one checks right away that the covering genus is roughly d squared over two. And the curves you get, see, if you just take a hypersurface and you intersect it with a plane, you got a plane curve of degree d, and that has genus roughly d squared over two, and you can't, asymptotically, you can't do much better than that. Okay, so that's the story for hypersurfaces. Now, um, there are a number, already some interesting questions here, which is that anytime you have a statement for hypersurfaces, uh, you typically also expect statements for complete intersection. So what's, what's a complete intersection? So a complete intersection, instead of having one hypersurface, you take, let's say, E hypersurfaces in Pn, Pn plus E, and you look at their transversal intersection. And that's called a complete intersection hypersurface. And usually these behave rather like just single hypersurfaces. Um, and, but what's interesting here is that the story actually isn't, isn't known in this case. So, um, so supposing you take such a complete intersection um, uh, uh, variety of dimension n. So I have an n-dimensional uh, variety of the complete intersection of hypersurfaces of these degrees and Pn plus E. So you can, when, when X is a curve for one dimensional complete intersections, you can, um, you can prove, you can estimate the, I mean, you can prove a lower bound on the ganality and it looks like this. So it's basically the product of the, of the degrees. And um, so I guess I noticed this some years ago, this is from general curves, this isn't the best possible, but this is always realized. And, um, but strange, and it uses some kind of, strange enough, it uses Bogomolov's theorem on vector bundles on surfaces. So it's a little bit funny, but in higher dimensions, the, 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 the question for, the, for these positivity measures, measures and irrationality invention, uh, in, invariance isn't known. So it's a, what I consider a very interesting conjecture in this area. So the conjecture, my, the conjecture roughly is that if you look at these, um, if you look at these, let's say, degrees of irrationality or covering ganality, they should grow multiplicatively in the degrees. So that's roughly like the degree of X. And that's actually still not known. And the best result is a, is a nice result of Nathan Chen, who is a kind of an asymptotic result in the case of a co-dimension two complete intersection. So he shows that if you take a very general complete intersection of two hypersurfaces, then you do get a multiplicative bound uh, uh, asymptotically. But in general, I think it's a very interesting question to see what kind of, uh, the, see the, the positivity of the, the naive positivity of the canonical bundle of the N zero forms grows additively, but you would expect multiplicative bounds. So this is kind of an interesting, still an interesting question. Uh, to my mind, one of the most interesting results in this area is a theorem of uh, Nathan Chen and David Stapleton about hypersurfaces in the Fano range. So remember these questions of irrationality, irrationality or the subtle range is when the degree is at most n plus two, or degree is, le is most n plus one, so less than n plus two. And th th these are very subtle because there are no, the, the simple obstruction to rationality, which is the presence of holomorphic uh, n forms, uh, uh, regular N zero forms doesn't, they're always zero in this range. But they were able to, um, to nonetheless prove a very nice result uh, that it's still, so they show that if you take, you fix this, uh, this difference, so N plus one minus D. So this is, the, this is how much D is smaller than this. Then as the dimension grows, this degree of rationality grows at least like square root of N. So that's, a, again, that's a, I think this is one of the most interesting results. And their very nice idea was to adapt a, an old argument of Collar, which uh, proved irrationality of hypersurfaces in this range, 
by exploiting differential forms and characteristic P. So it's, it was, it's a very, this was, Kolar's argument is from the 90s. It's a very interesting, it was a very sort of interesting argument that these guys uh, found a nice way to sort of extend that to, to this uh, degree of irrationality. So let me just quickly say what the idea is. So what in, 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 um, in over the complex numbers form, you know, hypersurfaces of low degree certainly don't carry any holomorphic forms. But what Kolar noticed is that um, in characteristic P, you can find when well, they're not exactly hypersurfaces, but limits of hypersurface that carry non-zero differential forms. So, you know, in characteristic P, differential forms are funny because, you know, derivative of X to the P is zero. So funny things can happen in characteristic P. And so he was able to produce limits of these of hypersurfaces that carry uh, non-zero differential forms in characteristic P. And then they're not ruled. So they're not, it, it's a theory that proves that they're not in characteristic P, they're not birational to a, something cross P1. On the other hand, it's known that being ruled behaves well under specialization. So if you have a family of varieties, if the general run is ruled, then the special run is ruled. So Collar's uh, very nice idea was to take these funny things in characteristic P, lift them to characteristic zero, and then specialize. So in characteristic P, they can't be ruled because of these funny differential forms. And so they couldn't be ruled in characteristic zero. And what Chen and Stapleton did is they were able to generalize this argument to show a similar thing uh, for these uh, measures of irrationality. So they showed that Collar's examples don't admit low degree covers to ruled varieties. And then they proved a specialization result for varieties um, they didn't make low degree covering. So this was a very this is a, a very nice story there. Okay, so I think hypersurfaces are now pretty well understood. Okay, so the next case, the sort of in the going back to the sort of complex numbers. Uh, so the idea is that the these these you know questions of irrationality and these irrationality invariants are easiest to handle when there are a lot of differential forms when they're when they're when the cotangent bundle is very positive. So the interesting cases come up when you have uh, surfaces whose first churn class is zero. So that means they uh, don't carry many, many holomorphic forms. So there are two classes of surfaces uh, with C1 equals zero, and they have one dimensional family of two zero forms. So first of all, you can have K3 surfaces. So these are surfaces, um, well, like a quartic surface in P3 or a complete intersection of a quadric and a cubic in P4. So these are the surfaces with, um, uh, they carry a unique two zero form, which is symplectic. And then there are some abelian surfaces. So this is a two dimensional complex torus and they carry a line bundle whose self intersection is uh, is 2D. So these are, um, these are, um, uh, these are the two classes of surfaces that have uh, C1 equals zero and they're, they're, they have a one dimensional family of two zero forms. And it's elementary that their covering denality is two. Um, so for example, it's famous that a K3 surface is covered by a one dimensional family of singular curves of genus one. So those have, um, and those, those admit degree two maps. Uh, those are the surface curve of genus one is hyperliptic. Okay, so these the covering denality in these cases are is, is no question, but uh, and it doesn't depend on this kind of the degree. So the degree of the K3 surface or the degree of the Abelian surface. But um, I had always assumed, and I still kind of assume, at least in one case, that is this like the degree, the sort of degree invariant goes up, then the degree of irrationality should also go up, should go to infinity. Okay. So my, to my considerable surprise, Nathan Chen observed that for abelian surfaces, this is maximally false. So not only does the degree of irrationality not go to infinity, it's always at most four. So it's these abelian surfaces uh, always admit, no matter how complicated the abelian surface, it always admits a degree four map to P3. And the idea is that you can look at what's called the Krimer surface, uh, A, you mod out this thing by multiplication by minus one, and you realize that as a singular degree four surface in P3. So 
even for these complicated abelian surfaces, they always have um, degree, of, they always can be expressed in a funny way as a, a rational covering of P2 with degree of most four. And in fact, Olivier Martin showed that in most cases you can't get degree three. Um, but interestingly enough, the situation for K3 surfaces is still unclear. So I believe uh, with all my heart that the degree of irrationality goes to infinity, and that would be a very nice theorem, but uh, it's completely unknown at the moment. Okay, so that surfaces with uh, C1 equals zero. What happens if we go to higher dimensions? So the interesting, the, the sort of natural class to a variety to consider in higher dimensions with uh, uh, you know, trivial C1 is abelian varieties. So let's look at an n-dimensional abelian variety. Uh, so what is that? So an n-dimensional abelian variety is just a complex torus that happens to admit a projective embedding. Okay, so we look at a complex torus that admits a projective embedding. And um, so when, at the moment, it's completely out of reach to discuss the uh, degree of irrationality of that. I have no, I, I don't think anybody has any guesses of whether that grows polynomial or exponentially or what. So I think there's no guess about that. But what, what is, uh, what's a kind of a more, not, a more manageable question is to look at the covering ganality. So you take this abelian variety and you ask yourself, what's the least ganality of a curve that exists on this, on this variety? So people had looked at the question of what's the least genus of a curve on an abelian variety, but um, let's ask the question of uh, what's the least ganality of a curve on an abelian variety. Now, it can't depend just on the dimension of the variety, because if you take a hyperelliptic curve, any curve has a, a what's associated, a, if you take a hyperelliptic curve of genus G or genus N, let's say, it determines an abelian variety of dimension N Oh yeah, I sh I'm sorry, let me just, I didn't explain this. So why is the covering ganality, the least ganality of a curve on A? So once you, the A is an abelian group. So once you find some curve of ganality, some ganality on A, then you can translate the curve and move it around by translation. And so uh, those cur the curve in its translates cover A. So to find the covering ganality on an abelian variety is the same thing as finding the least ganality of a curve on A. And as I say, it can't depend just on the dimension because a hyperelliptic curve of genus G or genus N that lives on an abelian variety of dimension N and it, so that abelian variety has covering dimension two. So um, what you should, the, the right question to look at is what's the covering banality of abelian varieties of dimension N for general varieties A, for general abelian varieties A. So again, there's some moduli space of abelian varieties and you ask for what happens for a general or for a very general point variety parameterized by a very general point of that variety. And there's this oldish result of Alzadi and Perola who showed that if you take a very general abelian variety of dimension at least four, then it doesn't contain any trigonal curves. So then it's covering the anomalies at least four. And a few years ago, Claire Voisin uh, found a nice way of generalizing their argument and what she showed is that if you take um, a very general of abelian variety of dimension N, then you, the lowest ganality family of curves that covers it has uh, ganality roughly the logarithm. And she conjectured that uh, instead of a logarithmic bound, you should get a linear bound. And a couple of years ago, that's what Olivier Martin proved. So, um, Again, but I don't think it's known. I don't think people really understand at the moment, like, is this a good bound? Like, I don't think it's known whether or not a Berlin variety of dimension N, there are curves of ganality, roughly linear in N that cover it. But in any event, this is a kind of a pretty satisfying, a pretty satisfying uh, statement. And their argument of Voisin and Martin involves some interesting new ideas. So I think, think I'll mention them. And then, because uh, it's a, this again is something that's come up a lot in the work of Voisin and Olivier Martin and these and other questions. And the idea is to study what's called the Chow group of zero cycles on, on A mod rational equivalence. Okay, so um, given this abelian variety A or any variety, but I'll say it for this abelian variety, you can look at what's called the Chow group of zero cycles mod rational equivalence. So a zero cycle on A, 
is just a formal Z linear combination of points. So it's like a, a zero chain on your variety. So you just take a finite Z linear combination of points. And, but there's an interesting, you put an interesting equivalent relation, interesting equivalence relation on it. So you say the two abelian, uh, two zero cycles are rationally equivalent. So here's zero cycle number one. They look like the same zero cycle. Sorry about that. Here's zero cycle number one, and here's zero cycle number two. And these, and I'm thinking of these as zero cycles on A. And these two zero cycles are rationally equivalent if I can find a one cycle on A cross P1 so that these are the, 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 the fibers of this. So for example, these three points are rationally equivalent to these three points, are rationally equivalent to these three points. Again, thinking of these as a triple of points on A. Now, if you're used to thinking about homology and topology, that this looks like it should be a trivial kind of equivalence relation, but it's absolutely not because it's very hard to find P1. Rational curves are rather scarce on algebraic varieties. And so not only is this not a, is a trivial equivalence relation, it turns out that this turns out to be such a fine equivalence relation that if you look at this group uh, of zero cycles mod this funny equivalence relation, in a certain precise sense, it's not even finite dimensional. So it's a very wild group. This is a famous theorem of Mumford from the late 60s. But um, nonetheless, you have a sort of a set theoretic map that takes a k-tuple of points on A. So that's a point in this kth symmetric power of A and sends it to its Chow class. Now, what's true in general is that if you fix uh, a, a class in, in this Chow group, the set of all k cycles that represent that class is a countable union of subvarieties. And what was and Martin prove, you, they use a sort of a delicate degeneration argument to show that if k is small and a is very general, then the fibers of this map are actually countable. On the other hand, supposing you have a curve in A whose gonality is less than or equal to K. Well, a curve whose gonality is less than or equal to K, that means this map curve, this curve maps to P1 with fibers of uh, degree at most, fibers of degree K or less. And so that gives you a P1 of K cycles of cycles of degree K on A. So a curve of small gonality on C, a curve of small gonality on A produces a positive dimensional fiber of this map. And so once you know that the fibers for small K and general A are countable, then that forces the gonality, means that you can't find a curve of small gonality. Okay, so um, let me just end with some, some other open questions. I think there are a lot of interesting questions in this area. Um, so one, which is was suggested a while ago by Ron Danaghi, is can you study measures of irrationality for some of the kind of celebrity moduli spaces that arise in algebraic geometry? So for example, there's the moduli space of curves of genus G or the moduli space of abelian varieties of dimension G. And so for example, look at the moduli space of, uh, of genus G. So it's a famous theorem of Harrison Mumford from 19, the early 80s, that that's irrational when G is, is large. And that's a huge theorem. So I think it's not, it's not really realistic, I don't think, to prove lower bounds on the irrationality. That seems completely uh, out of reach. But you might prove upper bounds on the irrationality. So for example, you can ask, what can you say anything about the covering gonality? So there's some kind of cheap bound you can get. So having to do with this is what's called a Hurwitz number. You count how many degrees, how many covers there are with fixed branch points, but you should be able to do much better. So what that means is if I take a very general curve of genus G, I want to find, um, I want to, I want to, um, I want to put it, I want to realize that curve as kind of in a family of curves. So those family of curves have relatively low gonality. And so you can imagine that there's some geometric construction that lets you, lets you do that. Another question uh, that you could look at, and people have done a little bit of this, is that questions of rationality and irrationality are always very interesting for varieties defined over fields, brown fields, other than the complex numbers. So for example, for example, for quadrics, it's, you know, if you look at quadrics defined over different fields, sometimes they're rational, sometimes they're not. 
So there's, you could kind of ask, there's a kind of potentially an arithmetic side to this story that I think should be quite interesting. So again, I don't think people have said too much about that. Okay, so, okay, so let me just sort of end now by um, just giving a kind of a preview of what I'll talk about in the next, um, in the seminar talk. So these, these measures of irrationality, we're asking, we've kind of been interested in the question, how, how irrational is it? Given a variety X that's known to be irrational, how, ir how irrational is it? So that's in some sense asking, the, that's like asking the question, if I give myself a variety X, how different, how different is it by rationally from projective space? So how, how, how much does it differ by rationally from projective space? And so um, the question I want to talk about next time and in the next hour is uh, this work with Olivier Martin on measures of association. So we're going to ask the question, instead of asking, given a variety X, how much does it differ rationally from projective space? We're going to say, if we have two varieties of the same dimension, what are, the, what are invariants analogous to the ones I've just talked about? that measure how far X and Y are from being birationally isomorphic to each other. So how different are two varieties birationally? So that's what I'm gonna talk about next time. So it's somehow the birational distance of two varieties from each other rather than a given variety to projective space.